Hello, and welcome to FRSC 1121 Firefighter Strategies and Tactics. I am your instructor, Adam Roberts. And even though this is not a live lecture, you can call me in the office at 706-357-0162 or email me at aroberts at athenstech.edu if you have any questions. So, let's get into Chapter 1, Preparation. Our objectives, discuss the behavior of fire, understand the benefits of training for the firefighter, company officer, and the fire department. Discuss the benefits of pre-planning, understand how to calculate the needed fire flow, and recognize the duties of both company and chief officers. Identify the traits of a person with command presence. Identify and discuss the 16 Firefighter Life Safety Initiatives. Understand the safe operation of fire department apparatus. Firefighters who respond to emergencies must be prepared to handle whatever they encounter. Their success is dependent on the training they receive. This training must encompass basic and advanced areas. Chapter 1 first examines the behavior of fire. It reviews the basic concepts of training, pre-incident planning, and how prior knowledge of a building can assist in accomplishing an overall safe operation. The needed fire flow can be utilized by fire officers to assist them in determining the necessary amount of water and personnel needed to handle hose lines at an incident scene. Chapter 1 further discusses company and chief officers and the importance of these positions and what these men and women must accomplish to serve the fire department and firefighters that they lead. It also reviews the 16 life safety initiatives that is followed and will keep firefighters safe. Behavior of fire, attitude to foster. Fire is a chemical process in which fuel, oxygen, and heat come together in an uninhibited chain reaction. It involves a rapid oxidation of combustible materials producing heat and flame. In order to have fire and common materials, these three elements, fuel, oxygen, and heat, are required and are often present as consisting of the fire triangle. The fire triangle. A fire triangle will cease to exist if any of these three sides are removed. Fire can exist in atmospheres containing oxidizers other than oxygen, such as chlorine. But for the discussion, we will focus on oxygen. Fuel may be eliminated by removing it. Oxygen may be eliminated by excluding air, and heat may be eliminated by cooling. In most cases, the removal of fuel from a fire is impractical, except when dealing with flammable liquid storage tanks or some arrangements so that if one should catch fire, its content may be pumped to an isolated or empty tank. Thus, the fire is extinguished by removing the fuel. Fires and flammable liquids are flowing from a pipe and burning may be extinguished if the pipe contains a valve and the flow of the fuel can be shut off. Again, this is in effect removing the fuel supplying the fire. The exclusion of oxygen from a fire may be achieved by converting the fire as with dirt, foam, or a wet blanket so that air cannot reach it. Reduction in temperature or cooling can be accomplished by the application of a substance that absorbs heat. Water is most commonly used for this purpose. It absorbs heat first by being raised to its boiling point and second by turning from a boiling water into steam. The heat that is absorbed is taken from the fire and reduces its temperature accordingly. The fire tetrahedron. There is a fourth method for extinguishing a fire referred to as the fourth side of the triangle that turns the triangle into the fire tetrahedron. 
The fire tetrahedron is an uninhibited chemical chain reaction that occurs when fuel is broken down by heat and the fire is extinguished as the chemical chain reaction is interrupted by extinguishing the agent. Classes of fire. The United States categorizes fire into five distinct classes. Class A, B, C, D, and K. This classification system is used for the purpose of extinguishment and to identify which fire extinguishers to use on any given fire. Class A fires. Class A fires involve ordinary combustible materials such as wood, paper, and textile. They are commonly extinguished with water, a method that uses water and an additive or with fire extinguishers. The additives used with water are known as wet water or wetting agents. And these are such things as class A foam and high expansion foam. They all increase the water's effectiveness. Wet water reduces the surface tension in the water, making it much easier to be absorbed by burning material. This is particularly helpful in deep seated fires, such as in bells, overstuffed furniture, and mattresses. Class A foam is a liquid foam solution made by introducing air into the mixture of water and concentrate. Bubbles from the foam blanket adhere to the fuel and gradually release the contained water to wet the fuel for a longer time than water alone. High expansion foam can be supplied from an expansion rate of 200 to 1 up to 1000 to 1. It is delivered through large sleeves pushed by high power fans and work by producing a cooling blanket of foam that excludes air from the burning material. It is particularly useful for basement fires and those in the holes of ships. Class A extinguishers consist of pressurized water extinguishers, multi-purpose dry chemical extinguishers, etc. Your pressurized water extinguishers contain water and sometimes a wetting agent. They are pressurized by an air compressor and can produce a 40 to 50 foot stream of water. They are effective on small incipient fires. Multi-purpose dry chemical fire extinguishers contain ammonium phosphate and this is a powder based and extinguishes by smothering, cooling, and radiation shielding, though studies suggest that a chain breaking reaction in the flame is the principle of the extinguishing agent when using a multipurpose extinguisher. Class A fire extinguishers are marked with a green triangle containing the letter A. Class B fires. Class B fires are those involving flammable liquids, combustible liquids, petroleum, grease, tars, oils, solvents, lacquers, alcohol, and flammable gases. These fires are extinguished using foam and fire extinguishers. Class B foams differ from Class A foam. Class B foams can be thick and viscous to blanket burning liquid surfaces, thin and rapidly spreading, capable of forming a vapor film of surface activate water solutions on a liquid surface, or use a large volume of wet gas cells for indenting surfaces and filling cavities. Dry chemical fire extinguishers can be used to control and extinguish flammable liquid fires. Your Class B fire extinguishers are marked with a red square containing the letter B. Class C fires are those involving energized electrical equipment. Dry chemical and carbon dioxide fire extinguishers are used on Class C fires because they will not conduct electricity. Carbon dioxide is a compressed gas that prevents combustion by displacing the oxygen in the air surrounding a fire and by cooling the fuel. A benefit of using carbon dioxide fire extinguishers is that they leave no residue. 
Fire extinguishers for Class C fires are marked with a blue circle containing the letter C. Class D fires are those involving combustible metals such as aluminum, magnesium, titanium, sodium, and potassium. These fires are commonly fought with specific types of extinguishers specified for that particular metal fire. As a general rule, water should not be used on metal fires because it can result in anything from minor fires to an explosion. The exception is that in some instances, water can be successful if applied in large quantities to a small combustible metal fire but a severe reaction or explosion should be anticipated. Fire extinguishers for Class D fires are marked with a five pound yellow star containing the letter D. Always ensure the correct Class D extinguisher is used for the burning material. Class K fires are fires and cooking appliances that involve vegetable oils, animal oils, or fats. The most effective extinguishing system for commercial cooking fire is a wet chemical commercial hood suppression system. Fire extinguishers, classified as multipurpose, A, B, and C, used in combination with the wet chemical suppression system will threaten the foam layer and cooling ability of the wet chemical agent, which could result in damage to the cooking appliance. These fires are commonly found, or excuse me, are commonly fought with fire extinguishers specifically intended for them and are generally found in commercial kitchens. Fire extinguishers for Class K fires are marked with the letter K or a black hexagon containing the letter K. Class K extinguishers can be used simultaneously with the hood suppression systems found in commercial kitchens. Only the Class K fire extinguisher is compatible with the wet chemical agents. Class K fires should not be confused with purple K fire extinguishers, which are designed for Class C fires. Spread of heat. Heat is generated when a combustible material comes in contact with a heat source. If there is sufficient oxygen, the combustible material will burn. Heat generated by the fire can spread to other materials and areas. The spread of the fire is dependent upon many factors, including the amount of heat generated by the fire, the distance of space between the building, the duration of the fire, the height of the building, and the type of building construction. Fire can spread through direct contact with flame as well as the three other methods, conduction, convection, and radiation. Conduction, heat is transferred by conducting through direct contact of materials. When different materials touch, the material with the greatest temperature will transfer heat to the material with the lower temperature until the temperature of both materials are identical. An example of a conduction of fire is when Floor joists are set in the same wall socket in adjoining buildings and are in contact with each other. Heavy fire involving a joist in one structure can spread undetected to a joist in the adjacent building. The ease with which fire spread via conduction depends upon the material involvement. Metal is a good conductor and once heated can ignite combustibles that are in contact with it even at a distance far from the original fire. Convection is heat that is conducted by gas or liquid. Air currents allow heat to rise through a structure if unimpeded by doors, walls, or ceilings. Once these air currents reach the top of the fire area, the smoke and heat will mushroom and start to spread laterally. As the smoke and heat fill the upper parts of the fire area, they will start to move back downward. The movement of heat and air currents can spread fire to uninvolved areas. Staircases are a ready path for 
air currents to spread fire from lower to upper floors, particularly in multi-story, single-family residential structures, where staircases are usually unenclosed. The proper use of ventilation by firefighters can channel the heat and smoke generated by a fire and vent it to the exterior to reduce its spread. Radiation. Heat from fire is radiated in all directions, including back toward the fire, which helps accelerate the chain reaction process. The rays travel in a straight line in all directions from the fire and continue to travel until the heat is dissipated or they meet an object. If the object is combustible, the radiant heat can cause it to ignite. If the object is not combustible, like a masonry wall, the object will absorb the rays and the rays will heat the object. Exposed buildings can often be protected by water streams being applied to the exposed surface to keep them cool, preventing ignition. The stages of fire. The five stages of fire are ignition, growth, flashover, fully develop, and decay. The ignition stage is the initial stage where the fuel, oxygen, heat, and uninhibited chemical chain reaction come together. The material is heated from a source. The fire normally starts small and is referred to as being in its incipient stage. The next stage is the growth stage in which the fire starts to develop. Growth is dependent on the amount of fuel and oxygen that is available and the absence of a built-in fire extinguishing system. An abundance of fuel and oxygen will allow the fire to develop rapidly. The contents of the room or area will become heated as the temperature of the fire increases. The increased temperature generates additional heat, smoke particles, and toxic products of combustion, primarily in a gaseous form. Heat and smoke rise throughout the fire area until it reaches the top level and starts to bank down, filling it with superheated smoke and gas. As the temperature builds to more than 1,000 degrees Fahrenheit, superheated gases will increase within the fire area and if sufficient oxygen is available, it will near flashover stage. Unlike in the ignition or incipient stage, in which a fire can be quickly controlled by a minimum number of firefighters, the larger fire will require a greater fire department response. The flashover stage is the transition between the growth stage and fully developed stage. The temperature of the fire area rises rapidly as the gas, products, and combustion reach their ignition temperature and ignite, increasing the intensity of the fire. The temperature of a flashover is estimated between 900 and 1100 degrees Fahrenheit, and your ceiling temperatures can easily exceed 1300 degrees Fahrenheit. Flashover is a simultaneous ignition of the surface area of the combustible material in the fire space. The flashover stage of fire does not always occur and there must be sufficient fuel and oxygen in order for it to occur. The intensity of the flashover is dependent upon the sufficient oxygen to sustain the burning. Ventilation openings can supply a source of air to the fire as firefighters enter the fire area. The fully developed stage occurs when all combustible material in the fire area involved in the fire. The heat released by the burning material will be at its maximum. As in the flashover stage, continued burning is dependent upon a sufficient supply of fuel and oxygen. Temperatures can exceed 2000 degrees. The decay stage occurs when the oxygen or fuel starts to diminish once all the burning materials are consumed. This process produces large volumes of smoke that contain carbon monoxide. 
Fires may also begin to decay due to the lack of oxygen. Smoke can reduce the amount of available oxygen, slowing the burning process, which reduces the temperature. A lack of oxygen can, however, create a smoldering state that could set the stage for a potential backdraft or smoke explosion. Multiple growth and decay stages. A fire burning outside in open air may have sufficient oxygen to allow a material to burn freely. However, a fire burning within a structure will depend upon the amount of available material and the amount of oxygen present to keep it burning. A fire in a structure burning through the growth stage is called a fuel limited control. As the burning increases, the oxygen within the structure is consumed and the layer smoke reaches the burning material. A ventilation limited controlled fire occurs as the burning increases and the oxygen is consumed and the layer smoke reaches the burning material. The reduction in air limits free burning and the oxygen level is reduced to less than 21%. As the fire burns, it will likely spread from the original material to other furnishings in the first room or fire area. The initial decay stage occurs once the oxygen level gets below 16%. Temperature in the fire room will remain high, but decrease throughout the rest of the structure as the heat release rate decreases. A pulsating action of the smoke may appear as a decay fire draws in more oxygen, which it will attempt to get from cracks or voids in the structure. If the fire is unable to pull in more air, it will self-extinguish. A second growth stage can occur should air enter the building through a window or door. If water is not applied immediately, the second growth stage could transition to flashover. After flashover, the fire grows to the point where there is more burning than can be supported by the air coming in through the opening that was created. At this stage, the fire is ventilation limited and the temperature of the structure will remain high. At this stage, the fire is ventilation limited and the temperature of the structure said will remain high. The fire is not vented, but it is venting and if not, excuse me, and if no additional windows fail or doors are opened or the holes cut in the roof, the fire winter the fully developed stage. If fire suppression has not begun and additional ventilation openings are created by the fire department, the newly introduced oxygen can transition the fire into a third growth stage. The fire will remain ventilation limited unless additional oxygen is made available or the fire becomes fuel limited. Suppression is initiated and water is supplied to the fire. So in essence, with this newer construction, you can have multiple growth and flashover phases, all dependent usually on the amount of oxygen in the structure. The structures now are so super tight and eco-friendly in terms of ventilation that no air is allowed to get in or out. So more times than not, our fires are going to be ventilation controlled. So be careful when you are making advancements into a structure because that injection of oxygen can cause it to flash or explode. So have water readily available to begin the extinguishing process to prevent it. Rollover, the term rollover is used to describe the fire or flame front that often is observed rolling along in the front of a burning material. A combustible gas is produced and liberated from the material that is ablaze. 
This gas mixes with oxygen in the air and begins to burn. Because the burning material consumes tremendous amount of air, there may be limited amount of oxygen in the upper levels of the room to support combustion of all the fuel being produced. This fuel-rich atmosphere will be pushed in front of the fire by the thermal column of heat from the fire and may not come within its flammable limits until it is several feet away from the main body of the fire. This is especially true in confined areas such as hallways. Because of this, fire appearance to be rolling along a ceiling level at a distance of 10 to 20 feet ahead of the main fire. What is actually being witnessed is a fuel-rich mixture being pushed ahead of the fire when it comes into its flammable limits, it will burn. Flashover is the ignition of combustibles in an area heated by convection, radiation, or any combination of the two. The combustible substance in a room are heated to the ignition point, which results in an almost simultaneously combustion of all the material. Because the entire area is preheated to its ignition temperature, it can become fully involved in fire in a matter of seconds. Some of the warning signs of imminent flashover are intense heat, free burning fire, unburned articles starting to smoke, and fog streams turning to steam a short distance from the nozzle. To reduce the likelihood of flashover, temperatures need to be lowered quickly by ventilation and water application. Backdraft. As fire develops, the combustion process creates an atmosphere deficient in oxygen, leading to the possibility of a backdraft or smoke explosion. Backdraft and flashover differ in the amount of oxygen present. In flashover, there is adequate oxygen available for combustion and the fire is free burning. In a backdraft, there is insufficient oxygen for active burning and the fire is smoldering. Backdrafts are rare because there usually is sufficient oxygen present. When backdraft conditions develop, gases such as carbon monoxide and carbonous particles smoke are produced that possess an explosion threat. Due to the high temperatures in the room, the fuel evolves into an ignitable vapor at or above their ignition temperature. All that is needed to complete the fire triangle is oxygen. If oxygen is allowed to enter the structure, the accumulated gases will ignite readily, spreading fire or causing a violent explosion. This is especially true when the oxygen is introduced from a lower area. The potential for backdraft exists in buildings, rooms, attics, or any combined space. The action required when a backdraft situation is recognized is to provide adequate ventilation above the fire. Ventilation relieves the pressure, venting the heat and smoke to the exterior. Ventilation is the first priority in backdraft conditions and must precede any fire attack. After proper ventilation is performed, rapid fire involvement must be anticipated as a fresh air is introduced into a previously unvented area. Training is the backbone of a fire department. It produces a well-prepared force that Thorough repetition can increase the speed of operation and enhance proper execution while reducing injuries. Firefighters who arrive in an emergency unprepared can be faced with life or death situations and will find themselves under extreme pressure to perform their duties. The firefighter benefits for training. All fire department members need to train. New members need to learn basic skills and senior members need the training as a refresher and to keep their skills sharp. As 
firefighters improve their skills, they experience less fumbling and fewer errors. They are able to gain confidence in themselves because they can perform their job at high levels. They develop pride in themselves and in their department. Training allows for continuous growth and their ability to prepare them to assume more responsibility while grooming them for promotion. As firefighters are promoted through the officer ranks, they should consistently receive training to allow them to better understand and accept the new roles they will be assuming and the responsibilities they will be undertaking. The promotion of a firefighter allows that individual to continue in the role of fighting fires, which he or she should be quite familiar with. Company Officer Benefits the company officer reaps many benefits from a highly trained crew. There is better control over operations. The training frees the officer from interruptions of unnecessary work questions, allowing more time for the officer to assume greater responsibility. The training improves the firefighter's overall ability and the officer has less fear of emergencies. The relationship between the officer and the firefighters become more pleasant and fewer troubles exist. This results in the officer having job satisfaction instead of a job headache. Department Benefits The department as a whole is a beneficiary. Training allows for consistent improvement in operations. The efficiency of the fire department is recognized by the citizen it protects. It can be directly linked to good public relations. This leads to public support and the support of politicians and community leaders. It will assist in the passage of bills that can be vital for fire department success and providing the necessary services to the public, which will continue to benefit the fire department. Training keeps morale at high levels, which are thought as intangible. Facilities in every function, or excuse me, in every facet, facilities of the functioning of the fire department. The firefighter will operate in a pleasant environment and will look forward to participating in the various departmental functions. Preparation is required. Training exercises must be challenging. Reading from the text obviously is boring and counterproductive. To conduct an interesting training exercise, the officer has to be knowledgeable and prepared. This involves prior reading and research to ensure that the goals of the training exercise will be attained. In addition to textbooks in the firehouse and training barrels, there are other outside agencies that should be explored, such as FEMA, National Fire Academy, Firefighter Close Calls, etc. An officer can maintain interest in the subject by asking students questions and seek input from all participants. Essentially, create a dialogue so you can discuss whatever topic you are trying to teach. Training permits mistakes to be made and corrections done in a non-emergency setting. The fire officer can take the time to stop the training exercise and point out the correction and the procedure. He or she can also explain what the problem can arise by failing to use the correct method. It can include difficulties that can occur if shortcuts are taken. Training fosters teamwork and cooperation. Training can be accomplished formally through drills and practical evolutions. Training can also be accomplished informal by explaining policies and procedures. Members can set goals and discuss their individual progress within their commanding officers and, and, and company officers. Performance Standards A department that established performance standards or timed evolution for engine and truck ladder companies and then trains utilizing the criteria will be better prepared to handle the various problems that occur at an incident scene. Development of performance standards are timed evolutions. It can be such things as stretching a tack line into the first floor of a structure while hooking up to a hydrant or obtaining a water supply from a tender. 
this basic evolution can then be changed to placing a portable ladder and stretching a hose line up ladder and through a window. Each evolution developed can become more complex by including additional functions. The agenda can be expanded to placing master stream devices in operation. Ladder companies or tower ladders can be placed their apparatus into operation for simulated fires requiring an available stream resources from upper floors or rescue utilizing a wire basket from elevated or below grade locations. The objective is to achieve a standard operation that emphasizes safety. Standardization lets members assigned to different units work together. The entire evolution must be specified and documented. There should be a maximum amount of time to complete an evolution. Using time frame simulates the stress found on the incident scene. It also demands teamwork on the part of all members to ensure that the time frame will be met. An excellent method to keep training interesting is to foster a competitive spirit among the various units. This can be accomplished by recording the time needed to complete each evolution and posting the individual times. Realize that speed alone should not be determining factor. Safe operation adhering to the entire performance standard must be judged. There should be a method of penalizing units for minor mistakes or admissions. Videotaping evolutions let the officer note a unit's strengths and discover areas in which improvement is needed. An excellent tool for the training division is to maintain tapes of the units performing the best times. This permits the recognition of these outstanding accomplishments while allowing other units to review the tape to take advantage of their expertise. In addition to the benefit gained by the company members, training on time evolutions, a fire officer should make note of the amount of time required to perform these evolutions. This can help the officer in assigning tactical operations when commanding a fire scene. Cross training. Fire departments should regularly schedule training involving multiple units. This should include the cross-training of members normally assigned to an engine on the operation of a main ladder or a tower ladder. Ladder company members get the opportunity to operate the pump on their engines. This should include members of such things as hazardous material teams and specialized units such as heavy rescue companies. This hands-on training gives members the opportunity to better understand how the various units function, allowing an emergency scene to operate smoothly. This also allows members when assigned to a rapid intervention crew to be able to utilize apparatus on the incident scene to assist in removing trapped firefighters. Departments should routinely train with multiple mutual aid departments. These exercises enable members to build friendships and share experiences that will benefit each department when called upon to operate together on further incidences. Pre-incident planning. It provides information. It is a method of gathering facts about a building or a process within a building. It lets a fire department evaluate conditions and situations in its area of responsibility prior to an emergency. Thorough evaluation, we can compare what we may be called upon to do with what we can do. Fire departments that utilize pre-planning find that it can mean the difference between success and failure at an emergency scene. Pre-incident planning allows us to anticipate potential problems, analyze possible solutions to those problems. Pre-planning responsibilities. The responsibility for pre-planning starts with a fire chief. Once a policy is established, all members of the fire department must carry it out. 
A chief officer should be assigned as a coordinator to oversee the pre-instant planning program. This person should have sufficient authority to ensure compliance by the company and chief officer. By placing responsibility with one person, the individual can decide what is best for the program. This permits standardization and continuity of all pre-plans. Should any questions arise, they can be directed to the individual. Consistency of forms, inspection method, and record keeping will result. Target hazards for pre and plan should be prepared, including the building or processes. Those that possess a high threat to life safety of those who work in the building or facility and those who live nearby. Those that create safety problems for firefighters and other emergency responders. Situations that can create a conflagration hazard. And that would present unusual and demanding situations for fire department personnel. Facilities or structures that have a high frequency of fires. Facilities that have a large economical impact on the community. Historical data enables us to select the most critical properties or specific problems in our community. Gathering information. The next step is gathering information to analyze the overall situation. The data should include both national and local statistics. What type of fires are common versus the type of buildings and occupancies found in each community? The analysis assists in determining potential problems. A plan of action can then be developed based upon what may occur. Documentation. Pre-planning is a tool that sets forth a framework for interfacing all fire protection components before an emergency occurs. It is a method of gathering facts and collating information. The planning process begins with an on-site survey. The responsibility for gathering information for the pre plan is usually assigned to the first two engine or truck company. The company should contact the building owner or responsible party and schedule a time to tour the facility. A thorough inspection can reveal locations where a problem could occur. It can identify immediate life threats and actions that the fire department can initiate to mitigate the problems. This meeting can enable both parties to discuss concerns about problems that firefighters may encounter and how the fire department and facility can solve these problems together. There are numerous ways to gather information and saving this valuable information. Yet, there must be a method of easily recalling the storm information during an emergency or the pre plan process will be useless. Store data. It can be very basic and kept on large index card for easy reference. This will limit the amount of information, but the data still will be easily accessible. It can be in a booklet consisting of multiple pages. This contains more comprehensive information, although it becomes more difficult to access because of the great amount of data. It can be in a database that is stored and retrieved information, including safety information that can be flagged and become immediately available by being printed out at the time of the alarm. This information can be sent automatically to the scene via onboard printers or fax machine. One drawback is it can be the cost of the system. It can be a palm size or a handheld computer that can quickly and easily retrieve the data. It can be a combination of index card systems 
that is backed up by a booklet, initial concerns can be placed on index cards and can be easily accessed to the initial units. Comprehensive information can be gleaned from the booklet after the initial concerns have been addressed and more specifics needed. Quality is the important concern here, gang. An overwhelming amount of data can be counterproductive. It can take too long to sift through the useless data before locating the needed information. The book method can contain a section on fire department concerns. This can cover areas of general concern and specific areas that would pose a threat to firefighters. It can include building renovations that might not show on the original building plot or plan, the presence of pressure reducing valves on a standpipe, and any specialized extinguishing systems utilized within the building, such as dry, chemical, or carbon dioxide. The presence and location of hazardous material in the building, flammable and explosive processes, the location of open shaftways or chases, special needs of any occupants there, such as disability or bed confine means of accessing egresses and floors or a plot plan. Phone numbers can change. Emergency contact personnel can change as well. Responders should review and update the information during their visit. Considerations. We must thoroughly analyze each situation. How will we be able to protect the building occupants and those in the threatened exposure? What evacuation plans have been formatted? Are there other means by which occupants can be protected, such as lateral evacuation or protecting in place? Are there protective systems in the building? Our on-site surveys should consider how construction features and protective systems assist or impede the fire department once the fire occurs. These include its entire building equipped with automatic sprinklers. Is an engine company assigned to pressurize the system? Standpipes will aid firefighters in placing hose streams on fire <clears throat> onto the fire. Is it a wet or dry system? Which fire department will utilize and will the pressure system be act? The pre-plan should consider the availability of resources. Many departments have a difficult time staffing apparatus at daytime hours and during the week because there may be a delay in the response personnel, the number of personnel that will be needed to perform a specific function must be established in the pre-plan. Alternate strategies must be formulated to anticipate reduced staffing. Resource utilization includes securing the service of outside agencies such as police, Red Cross, private security, public works, public health, utilities, or federal, state, and local aid. We must also take into account the development and utilization of an incident management system and all the agencies that are using the same system. A system will address the multitude of problems associated with large-scale instances and anticipate specific problem allowances. Disaster planning. There are certain facilities that should an emergency occur can have a direct impact on the immediate surrounding community. These include chemical plants, refineries, large water, fire, water purification plants, testing laboratories, and so on. These sites will require large scale plans with multi-agency planning and community input. This type of plan must have the support of every agency involved in order for it to succeed. A member of each supporting agency should be conferred with when drawing up the plan. The liaison person should have the authority to authorize specific commitments of resources in the event of an emergency. 
The inclusion of participating agencies in the planning process allows them to buy into the plan. Success or failure is dependent upon them as well. Community support should be sought. The immediate population around the site should be informed of evacuation plans and pre-fire drills. This can be accomplished through independent community groups such as churches or senior service citizen groups. Some communities have established strong relationships with industrial plants and work diligently for the betterment of both the community and the plant. The pre-plan can stipulate specialty equipment that can be used to be effective at the scene. Multi-aid response should be reviewed to allow proper deployment. A greater initial response may be indicated by the hazard present necessary to change of an existing policy. Plan review. Reviewing the pre-plan with the personnel of the effective facility is a positive step. It may open their eyes to the distinct possibility of destruction of the facility. It could initiate major changes to prevent a disaster. This may include separating processes that would react unfavorably during an incident, installing sprinkler systems, or increasing the available water supply on the premise. During an emergency, these same individuals can be utilized as technical specialists who can assist the incident commander. Testing the plan. Implementation of a pre-plan during a simulated exercise assists in adjusting the plan as needed. Basically what we're looking for is what worked well? What needs to be adjusted? What problem did the fire department encounter? If the company was involved in the exercise, did they have any problems? And did the plan facility find any discrepancies in the plan? The addition of contingency plans for foreseeable problems and their incorporation in the exercises should be encouraged. The plan should be reviewed annually to see if any modifications are needed or any changes have been made in personnel, contact information, or things of that nature. A problem facing the initial incident commander at a fire scene is how much water will be needed for effective fire control. This information will impact the incident in terms of determining needed resources and implementation of tactical operations. Determining the amount of water needed. Extinguishing a fire in a specific building is best accomplished during the pre-planning stage. This can be attained through a deliberate Calculation of the occupancy and concerning conditions when establishing the needed fire flow. When pre planning information is available to the initial incident commander, upon arrival at the incident, strategies and tactics decisions can be made more readily and accurately. To determine the needed fire flow during pre planning requires the application of a fire flow formula to the conditions observed during an inspection of the premise. On many occasions, fire instances are encountered where fire flow information is not available under these circumstances. Experienced fire officers are able to determine the need of fire flow based on their experience and knowledge. There are occasions when a newly appointed or relatively inexperienced officer Lacking the experience of a seasoned officer must quickly judge the amount of water needed to effectively control a fire. The National Fire Academy in Emmitsburg, Maryland has developed a formula that allows for quick calculation. This formula was derived through a study of fire flows that were successful in controlling a large number of working fires, along with interviews with numerous experienced fire officers from around the country regarding the fire flows that have found to be effective in various fire situations. The NFA quick calculation formula can be used as a tactical tool to provide a starting point for deciding the amount of water required at an incident. 
This will permit decisions to be made on the amount and type of apparatus needed to deliver the water and the number of firefighters that will be needed to apply it. The information developed indicated that the relationship between the area involved in the fire and the approximate amount of water required to effectively extinguish the fire can be established by dividing the square footage of the area of fire involvement by a factor of three. This formula is expressed as followed. Fire flow equals length times width divided by three. This formula is most easily applied in the estimating the square footage of the entire structure. It is used to determine an approximate fire flow for the local structure and then it is reduced accordingly for various percentage of involvements. The following example illustrates how the formula can be applied to a single family dwelling 60 feet long by 20 feet wide and one story high. So 60 by 20 divided by 3 equals 400 gallons per minute. So if the home was 100% involved, you would need to flow 400 gallons per minute. If the home was only 50% involved, then you would be doing 200 and 25 would be 100. This quick calculation formula indicates that if the dwellings were fully involved, it would require, again, as I said, 400 gallons per minute. So you would basically adjust accordingly and always err on the side of caution and go with the higher gallons per minute if you're ever in doubt. In multi-story buildings, if more than one floor in the building is involved in fire, the fire flow could be based on the area represented by the number of floors actually burning. So for example, the fire flow for a two-story building would have the similar dimensions as the building in the previous example. So 60 times 20 divided by 3 times 2, which is the number of floors, equal 800 gallons per minute if fully involved. If other floors in a building are not yet involved but are threatened by possible extension of fire, they should be considered as interior exposures. 25% of the required fire flow of the fire floor should be added for exposure protection for each exposed floor above the fire floor to a maximum of five interior exposures. In the previous example, a fire on the first floor would threaten a second floor and a 25% exposure charge should be added. A second floor fire would probably not threaten the first floor since the interior exposure would need it to be calculated. Exterior exposures. If exterior structures are being exposed to fire from the original fire building, 25% of the actual required fire flow of the building on fire should be added to provide protection for each side of the building that has exterior exposures. The following example shows how to apply calculations for exposures to our previous one-story dwelling with exposed exterior structures on two sides of the building. So 60 times 20 divided by 3 equals 400 gallons per minute. Now, with two exposures, 400 gallons per minute times the 25% times 2 will equal 200 gallons per minute. So, the total fire flow required is 600 gallons per minute for 100% involvement of the original fire area. If the exposure becomes involved in fire, either additional floor or multi-store building or adjacent structure, the exposure should then be treated as a separate fire area and calculated separately, then added to the required fire flow for the original fire area. It is important to remember that the answers provided by this formula are approximations of water needed to control the fire. The formula is geared to an offensive attack and is 
accuracy diminishes when the fire involves more than 50% of a structure and with defensive operations. Don't forget that you're estimating both the area of the building and the amount of fire involvement within the building. Because firefighting is not an exact science, the use of the quick calculation formula cannot be expected to determine the exact GPM that will specifically required for full fire control. It has been found that as the amount of involvement reaches a stage where defensive attack is necessary, the need of fire flow will be slightly greater than required by the formula. Available water supply. Available water flow must be known. The type and location of water supply should be specified. Provide exact locations of using hydrants or drafting sites. If a tender operation is to be used, determine how many will be needed to ensure a constant water supply. Determining the type of attack. Once the required fire flow has been determined, the capacity of available resources will determine the strategies and tactics needed to control the incident. If the fire flow capability of available resources exceeds the required fire flow, an interior attack of the fire can usually be made. However, before this decision is implemented, the incident commander should consider the following. Do existing conditions allow sufficient safety for firefighting on an interior attack? Are there sufficient firefighters on the scene? Is the fire area accessible? How many hose lines and firefighters are needed? Where is the best location to attack the fire from? And what support activities are needed? So for example, you would think about other activities to help extinguish the fire like ventilation, forceful entry, and things of that nature. If the fire fire, excuse me, if the fire flow requirements exceed the fire flow capabilities of available resources, a defensive mode of operation is usually required. In these situations, large hose streams, more apparatus, more equipment, and more personnel may have to be requested. Situations will occur in which fire is attacking lightweight structural components, and although there is sufficient water supply and resources, the conditions will be too dangerous for the offensive attack. The incident commander must recognize that situations will be encountered in which nothing can be done with the available resources to save the involved building. In these circumstances, exposure protection becomes the primary objective. Selection of hose lines. Recognizing that an inch and a half or an inch and three quarter hose line flows between 125 to 175 gallons per minute and a two and a half inch hose line flows approximately 250 gallons per minute, we can estimate the number of hose lines and resources needed to control the fire. While the formula will provide the incident commander with a starting point to determine how much water may be needed for an effective fire attack in normal situations, common sense and good judgment are required to evaluate the effect of the water on the fire as it is being applied. There may be unforeseen factors impacting the situation, such as barriers that prevent the water from reaching the seat of the fire or the building content that cause unexpected fire behavior. If control is not achieved within a reasonable period of time, the amount of water may have to be increased or a defensive attack may be needed uh, to be implemented. If immediate knockdown of the fire takes place, the amount of water applied can be reduced to minimize water damage to the structure and its content. The company officers are among the most critical members of a fire department. They may be selected by a civil service test appointed by the fire chief or elected by the members. The responsibility is the same regardless of the method of promotion or whether they serve as a career or volunteer department. The duties of the company officer. 
The company officer is the direct link for the firefighter between middle and executive management. He or she must maintain a critical balance between them. Officers must accomplish the goals of the department while looking out for the well-being of their firefighters. Often, this can be a demanding challenge. A company officer has to get work accomplished through others. This may be achieved in different ways. Whether an officer is an authoritative or congenial type is usually determined by his or her personality. This style is not as important as the fact that there must be consistency. Inconsistency occurs when attempting to be a hardline type officer one day and overly friendly the next. The change in style will lead to frustration on the part of the firefighter. It is better to find a style that suits you and be consistent in it. Company Leader Firefighters look to the company officer as their leader. A good leader leads by example. The officer who shares personal fire and emergency response experience with the members allow them to grow within their department and prepare them for a promotion. Respect and admiration is gained through many individual qualities. Company officers should seek a variety of ways to achieve personal development. Common sense, it can be developed if one works at it. Some are born with it. Basically, think before you act. Take time to stop, step back, and think before acting. People skills, determine how to bring out the best in your subordinates. Find the key to motivation that drives each individual. Publicly praise good behavior, and of course, privately criticize, or excuse me, privately criticize mistakes. So praise in public, discipline in private. Knowledge of the district. The officer should do a risk analysis of the units responding district and community. Special attention should be given to all target hazards, and their pre-plans should be reviewed while at the scene. Teamwork. Chief officers do not extinguish fires. Chiefs develop the basic strategies and the fulfillment of the orders to achieve the chief strategies is the responsibility of the company officers and firefighters. Company officers may be called upon to perform the role of incident commander. Upon being relieved, they may be assigned to a command sector or return to their company. Training is the backbone of every good organization. Writing assignments. This means assigning tools and basic tasks to the firefighters. So at the start of each shift, it is a good idea to basically inform everyone what job they're doing, what tools they will be carrying in on a given call, and things of that nature. The company officer is responsible for training, fitness of the members and himself or herself, and the mental readiness for the entire crew. Determine the route and regulate the speed of the apparatus on emergency responses. The company officer must size up the structure upon arriving at the incident. So the company officer has a whole list of things they need to do on a daily basis. And the only way the company officer is going to be able to accomplish many of these tasks is through teamwork and effective communication between the company officer and the firefighters. Make sure your firefighters know what to expect from you. Again, be consistent in the way you act and the way you want things done. This will allow for things to flow more smoothly and be more efficient. 
The officer's thought process should be geared toward predicting areas where pitfalls could endanger company members. Observations must include such things as reading the building prior to entering or to consider secondary means of egress and sharing this information quickly with the firefighters so they can react quickly if the need to utilize the secondary exit comes up. Size up should also include any unusual conditions that could be indicators of an arson fire. Safety is one of the most important responsibilities of a company officer. Incident scene safety doesn't just happen. It must be anticipated and addressed in training sessions. The company officer must ensure that everyone is wearing all PPE and they operate within scope of the incident command system. The chief officer. This individual is the leader of a fire department. This position of chief can encompass a variety of ranks from battalion, district, division, deputy, assistant, and chief of the department. There are differences between a chief and a company officer. The experiences learned as a company officer will be the foundation that the chief officer can build upon. Personal development. Knowledge needs to be expanded as one is promoted to company officer and again to chief officer. The chief officer must assess the scene and assign necessary units to accomplish the strategies developed. Knowledge. Knowledge of the fire scene and building construction is crucial. A company officer must build upon the knowledge to order the proper size and number of hose lines and their placement and to understand the duties required of the truck or heavy company in placing ladders or assigning search and rescue crews. Management. Before being able to manage others, the chief must consider and manage himself or herself. A critical factor causing a breakdown is poor communication. Delegation. Chief officers who fail to manage their own time will be ineffective with delegation. Delegation is a major part of leadership. It permits subordinates to assume responsibility and make decisions. It permits a supervisor to assess the skills of the subordinate. It is a necessary training process. So, what is expected of a chief officer at an incident scene? Leadership, for one. Direction, safe operating procedures, problem solving, common sense, Unity of command, teamwork, dependability, initiative, positive attitude, enthusiasm, professional conduct, and the ability to adapt to ever-changing situations. At an incident, the chief after surveying the scene by doing a 360 degree walk around, should establish a position in the front of building from which to command the incident. The chief officer must rely on the company officer to, his or, to be his or her eyes and ears. The chief officer must interpret the verbal reports received and compare them to what is observed on the outside. Essentially, you are outside the structure, you are looking at the conditions, you are listening to the reports, and you need to decide, are things getting better or worse? 
Is the job getting done or not? Do you need to change up your tactics or your strategy? Sectoring. As a fire increases in size or complexity, higher ranking chief officers will respond and often assume command. Other chief officers can be assigned to supervise various divisions or groups. Essentially, let's say you have a very large warehouse and you can't see, obviously, all four sides, or maybe even for that matter, you can't even see two sides. So you assign other ranking officials or higher chiefs to take control of each side. So the Alpha, Bravo, Charlie, and Delta side. So that's a good example of breaking things up and putting them in sectors or divisions or groups. The safety of everyone operating at an emergency is an awesome responsibility. There can be a fine line between what is acceptable and what presents too much of a risk to your firefighters. If in doubt, we must err on the side of safety. Specialization. The chief needs to understand what can be accomplished with the various apparatus, tools, and equipment at his or her disposal. With the proliferation of hazardous material, the threat of terrorism, and other special operations, there will be many demands on the chief at these types of incidences. The ability to command an incident scene takes preparation and development on the part of the incident commander. It is a demanding, autocratic position. The critical nature of the emergency scene does not allow decisions to be made by a committee. There can only be one person in command. Self-discipline. Similar to your firefighting skills, command presence must be developed. Although easily recognized, it can be difficult to obtain. Leadership starts with the ability to possess self-discipline. A good leader knows what needs to be accomplished and gives deliberate orders that are easily understood. When indecisive orders are issued, they leave doubt in the minds of those receiving the order. Leaders will gain respect from their peers more easily if they have the ability to remain calm. Visualize incident scenes. Placing yourself in various locations can test your command leadership ability by going over how to handle the problems that might arise. Visualizing scenarios allows us to prepare for the eventuality of certain occurrences. Utilize experience. Draw upon what worked well in your previous situations. Experience allows us insight to whether the tactical employees will achieve the strategic goals. Time factors must be considered when dealing with specific kinds of instances, and physical abilities and stamina have their limits. Attempting to accomplish too many tasks with insufficient personnel will often fail to achieve the desired goal. The learning process. The study of text, fire journals, and case studies can significantly broaden our knowledge. Firefighter safety must be a priority in every fire department in every aspect of fire department operations, whether it be training, station activities, and especially in the incident scene. The attitude of safety 
must initiate at the fire chief level and be fully understood and enforced at all ranks. It must be realized that unsafe acts are not acceptable and will not be tolerated. The Firefighter Life Safety Initiative. The first National Firefighter Safety Summit was organized by the National Fallen Firefighter Foundation and held in March 2004 with the goal of identifying methods for preventing line of duty firefighter deaths. Previous, there were approximately 100 firefighter line of duty deaths per year. The established the objectives of reducing the fatality rate by 25% within 5 years and 50% within 10 years. From this summit and six mini summits held between 2004 and 2007, 16 major initiatives were created as a blueprint for achieving this objective. These are the Everyone Goes Home program and the 16 Firefighter Life Safety Initiative. For these initiatives to work, they must be adopted and implemented by fire departments. Firefighter Life Safety Initiatives define and advocate the need for a cultural change within the fire service relating to safety and incorporating leadership, management, supervision, accountability, and personal responsibility. Number two, enhance the personnel and organizational accountability for health and safety throughout the fire service. Number three, Focus greater attention on the integration of risk management with incident management at all levels, including strategic, tactical, and planning responsibilities. Empower all firefighters to stop unsafe practices. Develop and implement national standards for training, qualification, and certifications that are equally applicable to all firefighters based on their duties they are expected to perform. Develop and implement national medical and physical fitness standards that are equally applicable to all firefighters based on their duties they are expected to perform. Number seven, create a national research agenda and data collection systems that relate to the initiatives. Number eight, Utilize available technology wherever it can produce higher levels of health and safety. Thirdly, investigate all firefighter fatalities, injuries, and near misses. Ensure that grant programs support the implementation of safety practices and or mandated safety practices as an eligibility requirement develop and champion national standards for emergency response policies and procedures. Develop and champion national protocols for response to violent incidences. Number 13, provide firefighters and their families support access to counseling and psychological support. Number 14, provide public education with more resources and champion it as critical fire and life safety program. 15. Strengthen advocacies for the enforcement of codes and installation of home fire sprinklers. 16. Make safety a primary consideration in the design of fire apparatus and equipment. Safety operation of fire department apparatus. The legal responsibility placed on fire departments and firefighter driving the fire apparatus is closely scrutinized. This can be seen in changes, or excuse me, in charges and lawsuits against many apparatus drivers who have been involved in accidents. 
Examples of firefighters and police involved in serious accidents while responding to and returning from the incident include the following. A firefighter driving a fire apparatus was arrested and negligent homicide charged were logged against him for allegedly speeding through a stoplight and striking another vehicle and killing its two passengers. An accident while responding places at risk those in the apparatus, pedestrians, and drivers of other vehicles. Not only going to the incident, but coming back when there's no emergency at all. Some important things to remember. Excessive speed does not guarantee arriving in less time, but it can lessen the possibility of arriving at all. The use of sirens and warning lights do not give anyone the right away. State law typically requires that emergency vehicles be operated in a safe manner. Basically, they use the term due regard. This means stopping for red lights to ascertain that all traffic has stopped and heard you and has pulled over and stopped to allow you passage. Essentially, what you're doing is asking for permission. So let's review right quick some driver training in America. In 1917, UPS gave its bicycle messengers and those who drove its Model T delivery vehicles their first offensive driving handbook. Private industries, and UPS in particular, value safety driving. The first driving handbook exposed, or excuse me, expounded on five seeing habits. And these are still used today, and these are a great concept use when driving an emergency vehicle or your personal vehicle. So we'll go through each one of these and harp on them a little bit. First, aim high in steering. Two, get the big picture. Three, keep your eyes moving. Four, leave yourself an out. And five, make sure they see you. So aim high in steering. When we aim high in steering, we should be looking not only at where we are, but where we will be in one block or two block segments. On a highway, our vehicle should encompass as far ahead as we can see down the highway. When responding to an emergency, vehicle changing lanes too often can confuse the drivers trying to get out of your way. If possible, select a lane and try to fully utilize it. If traffic is gridlock, you may need to consider a parallel roadway or an alternate route or have another company dispatched from another direction. A consideration in the intersection where you could expect to meet adjacent responding companies should be kept in mind. Should a unit member not be responding on the normal route from their station, they should notify the other responding units of this change of the response route. Essentially, if you think you're going to come to an intersection where somebody else is going to be, you need to announce it over the radio saying, you know, engine whatever approaching the intersection of XYZ to let other responders know that you're approaching. That way they can use caution in the area and avoid any incidences. Get the big picture. Know at all times where other vehicles are around you. Anticipate the action of aggressive drivers and give yourself plenty of room in front of you. Remember guys and gals, you are driving a fire truck. This is not a little sports car, a Fiat, or any other type of, of small passenger vehicle. These things do not stop on a dime, contrary to popular belief. Keep your eyes moving. Move your eyes up and down and from side to side. 
try to anticipate the movements of people on the sidewalk and crosswalk. Elderly pedestrians may have impaired hearing or vision and may not see you. I always attempt to make eye contact with other drivers and pedestrians when changing lanes or going through an intersection. Be aware in neighborhoods of children chasing balls or family pets into the street. You must have complete control of the apparatus at all times. Always leave yourself an out. Ensure there is enough of space around your vehicle to get out. Be aware of your apparatus's braking distance. Driving time of a firefighter for an apparatus can be 10 hours a week or less. Adjust driving to road conditions or inclement weather. Always make sure they see you. Use your siren. Use your lights. Understand that your sirens and lights can be reduced by tall buildings, intersection and curves, and even with the newer vehicles and the sound insulation, they may not see you at all until you're right up on them. Air horns effectiveness can be diminished if sounded continuously. Sound systems, headphones, and cell phones can prevent warning devices from being heard. A lot of times, if a driver isn't aware that you're right behind them, and then you come up on them, and then they realize the, the air horns blasting at them and the lights are flashing, they can panic and come to a dead stop or make radical movements to the right or left. Be mindful of this. Don't tailgate. And again, leave yourself an out. Most serious accidents occur at an intersection. Your SOG should be specific that all apparatus come to a complete stop at a red light. The apparatus driver should remove their foot from the accelerator when entering these blind intersections. Come to a complete stop, gang. Ease your way out. Make eye contact with all drivers. Ensure that everyone has stopped and knows that you're there. Fixed objects. Drivers frequently strike fixed objects, especially when backing an apparatus. The driver needs to be guided, even if there's an onboard camera. Get the people out of the truck and have them mounted on each side of the apparatus and watch, gang. Drivers need to be cognitive of the entire width and length of their vehicle, as well as the height must be considered when encountering low bridges and tree limbs over the streets. Drivers should know locations where there are inherent driving hazards. Other things to think about when you're driving. Maybe you're going over a two-lane bridge and there is fencing on the side of them. You may need to take the middle and occupy both lanes because that fencing could come in on the lane. Now, in this day and age, they're supposed to put those fences up to prevent jumpers, but when they start coming in on the lane, even though you may be within the white line, there is an overhang over the lane and you could quite possibly strike it with your emergency vehicle. So know how tall your vehicle is. Arriving at the scene, once you get there, gang, slow down as you near your location. Start checking for hydrants near the building. Slowing allows for addresses of the incident to be located much easier so you don't go blowing by them. The front of the building should be re reserved for your first due ladder truck in case ladder operations are needed. Always, always use your seatbelt. Not wearing seatbelts has led to firefighters being injured or killed in the accidents in the past and they, they've only gone up. No apparatus should be moved until all passengers have their seatbelt fastened. 
as the officer it is your responsibility to ensure that everyone has their seat belt fastened prior to the apparatus departing now firefighters should become courteous and defensive drivers we should never assume or demand the right of way the company officer is responsible for the route taken and the speed of the apparatus don't make an emergency situation worse by having an accident and not arriving you need to exhibit control at all times by not arriving in a timely manner we impact the lives of those counting on us so we've covered a lot so let's review some key concepts one understand fire behavior and the different types will assist in rapid extinguishment remember the six P's proper prior planning prevent poor performance the better the planning the more professionally the scene will be managed being successful as an officer requires hard work persistence and perseverance the 16 life safety initiatives must be adopted and enforced to reduce line of duty fatalities and injuries so you have plenty of questions to go over this week in the review as well as another chapter to read so if you guys have any questions feel free to call me in the office at 706-357-0162 or email me at aroberts at athenstech.edu. Until next time, be safe and have a great day.